second talk of the day, which is by uh, Nicolas Bernal. Nicolas, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so let me share the screen. Ah, I cannot. Host disabled participants screen sharing. Uh, ah, it's because I'm not co-host anymore. We have to. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, Nicolas. I, I thought I made it. Ah, because you got out. Yeah, but ah. it disconnected. Uh -huh. uh, sorry about that. Now you're co-host. Sorry. Okay, thanks. No, no problem. So, okay, so in the meantime, uh, Nicolas is from the Antonio Nariño University in Colombia, and he will talk about dark matter in the time of uh, primordial uh, black holes. So, many thanks and go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. So, yes, I will talk about um, this work that have been on in collaboration with uh, Oscar Zapata from Universidad de Antioquia. Uh, Jubert, I think you all know him. And um, so, he's Jubert on the left. And then um, Fazdullah Hafarim, who is a, a postdoc at uh, Padua, and Yong Shu, who is finishing his PhD in, in Bonn with Manuel Dred. And by the way, both Fazdullah and Yong are in the job market. So to get contact by them, this item. So, yes, I will talk about um, yes, dark matter and interaction with the primordial black hole from Nicolas Bernal from Universidad Antonio Nariño in Bogota, eh, Colombia. So first, a couple of words about the dark matter. So I guess that you guys are super convinced about the existence of, of this dark matter, but let me just say a couple of, of, of words about it. So there are several observations that indicate the existence of this uh, missing gravitational force of this uh, dark matter. And the key point is that it comes at very different scales. So for instance, the scale of kiloparsecs or so scale of uh, galaxies, we have the flat behavior of this um, 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 rotation across of, of galaxies. And the same happens at not a much higher galaxy at the level of omega parsecs with the, exactly the same cloud behavior of the rotation course of, of, of clusters. Also, you have this very famous example of, um, of the bullet cluster. And even that higher, higher scale, for instance, cosmological scale, when you have the CMB and isotopies, or it's measured by a Planck which can be very well explained in the framework of the lambda CDL model where, where dark matter in particular called dark matter plays uh, a major role. So I think we're all convinced about uh, the need of this dark matter. So the question is how was dark matter produced in the, in the early universe? So if we have different alternatives and by far the most popular one is uh, dark matter being a, a, a wind particle, so a weakly interactive matter particle. And the idea here is that dark matter interacts with the standard model with uh, some strong enough um, reaction rate so, so that uh, a couple of dark matter particles will annihilate into, into standard model particles in the early universe. So you have this kind of process, but also the reverse one. So where a couple of, uh, of standard model particles produce a couple of dark matter particles, right? And the key point is that this process could happen and they happen exactly the same rate. So that the dark sector reaches chemical equilibrium with the standard model sector. So the idea is that in the early universe, dark matter follows the, the, the equilibrium density, which is here denoted by this dashed line. So you have the dark matter that at some point due to the expansion of the universe, I mean, this, this equilibrium is broken and dark matter is said to, to freeze out. And that's why you generate, that's how you generate the, the observed dark matter abundance in the, in, the early, in the early universe. So for that, you have to have so strong enough reaction rate, a strong enough portal between the two sectors, the visible and the dark sector. However, that's not guarantee, guaranteed. And one can think about a scenario where the coupling, so the portal between the two sectors is, uh, is not strong enough so that two uh, sectors reach chemical equilibrium. And that's the, instance, the case in, in, the, in the FIMP dark matter paradigm, where dark matter can be produced out of standard model particles. So these reactions can happen, can efficiently happen. However, uh, dark matter will basically not annihilate into standard model particles. I mean, even if these two reactions will happen, we want to avoid equilibrium. So this reaction will happen at different uh, 
a different rate. So that's why we have a like, very different production mechanism. So dark matter is produced slowly. So we could say that it's produced despacito, pasito, pasito, sorry, suavecito. And at some point, uh, again, due to kinematics, we're not able to produce more uh, dark matter. So dark matter freezes in. And that's why we, how, that's how we produce uh, the, the, the observed dark matter abundance in the, in the, early, in the early universe. So typically for having weeds, you need a portal cut of couplings of the order of order one. For themes, however, we need much more couplings or the same to maintain 10 or so. However, such a small coupling, I mean, that's not even guaranteed that we can have a, uh, this kind of interaction between the two sectors. Actually, the only interaction that is guaranteed between the two, the two sectors is, is gravity, right? So for instance, you think about the Higgs portal or the kinetic mixing or the neutrino portal that could be exactly zero. So that would be like a, a, a very bad scenario for us, particle physics. So the question is what if dark matter only couples the standard mode via gravitational interaction? And actually, let me emphasize that that's the only uh, interaction that is guaranteed between the two, between the two sectors. So how could we produce dark matter in that, uh, uh, in that case? So one option is to produce it via the uh, Hawking operation of primordial black hole. Because in that case, I mean, dark matter is unavoidably produced in that scenario, right? So there, there are no couplings if you want to tune. Okay, so what idea of primordial black hole? I mean, if we have large density fluctuations in the early universe, they can collapse into primordial black hole. Right? So once they are produced, they will lose mass by emitting all particles via Hawking operation. And when we say all particles, means really all particles that exist, that ever exist. So standard model particles, but also beyond standard model state. So these primordial black holes at first will have a black body spectrum, which a temperature, which is basically the inverse of, of, of their mass. So once generated, the primordial black hole will lose mass. Right, so the mass will decrease, and therefore its temperature will, will, will increase, meaning that you will produce any old particles, uh, no matter how heavy they are. So even super super heavy states will be produced at some point during the, the evaporation. Uh, and of course, dark matter will also be be be, be produced in in this in this evaporation. So important point is that if the primordial black holes are are lighting up. And light by light, I mean lighter than say dozens of, of hundreds of tons. They will completely evaporate before the onset of BBM, and therefore they are they are very poorly constrained, as as you will see. So of course, if you want to study the dynamics of the primordial black hole, this is like really a complicated uh, thing because I mean you have to have you have to have like a, what's the inflationary dynamics, how reheating happens, what's the power spectrum, blah blah. So, however, he will not enter into that uh, game. However, we'll take if you want an effective approach where a single black hole is characterized by, by its mass. So, in the bulk of this, I will assume Schwarzschild uh, black holes, I mean, meaning without spin. However, at, at the end of the talk, I will talk a bit uh, about, um, about the spin, what happens when, when we have a current uh, black hole, so with the, with, with the spin. So, at least for, for Schwarzschild black holes, so a single black hole will be characterized by, by its mass of formation, which I will call M initial, or equivalently, that it corresponds to the standard model temperature at formation. So T initial is the standard, the, the standard temperature of the standard model plasma at which uh, these uh, um, monochromatic primordial black holes will be generated. Okay, that, that's for a single black hole, or where we don't want one, one, a single one, we want a collection. And the number, if you want, of the black hole, so the density of black hole will be parameterized by this guy, beta. And beta is basically, well, it's just the, the ratio of the energy density stored in primordial black hole over the energy density of the standard model at the time of formation. Okay? So now the question is what, what's the dark matter density radiated by primordial black hole? So the computation is very easy. So the dark matter density is basically, or it's just the primordial black hole density times the number of dark matter particles emitted per primordial black hole. 
And as we, at a, at a first approximation, the spectrum of uh, primordial black hole is a black body spectrum, right? With a very known temperature. And it's possible to compute the number of dark matter particles radiated per primordial black hole. And it will only depend on the initial primordial black hole mass if dark matter is light, lighter than the initial, its initial temperature, or it will only depend on the dark matter mass if, if the mass is lighter than the initial primordial black hole uh, temperature, right? So the Yeah, like non relativistic matter, so like uh, uh, scale factor forward minus three, they will naturally dominate the total energy density of the universe. And therefore, primordial black hole will naturally give rise to a non standard expansion rate of the universe, so a non standard cosmology. Okay, so here I'm showing you a plot of beta. Remember that beta is a proxy of the quantity of black holes, so density of black holes. So beta is just the energy density stored in black holes normalized by the standard model energy density as a function of the primordial black hole mass, yeah, the initial mass, or the temperature of, uh, at formation. So we know, I mean, we are constrained uh, the, this initial temperature by, by CMB, by the scale of inflation. And we want them to ever fully evaporate before BBN because you, we, don't, we, we don't want to, to modify that. That means that the initial black, the, the initial mass is in the ballpark of say few grams to few hundreds of tons. That's a typical uh, uh, mass scale for the, for the black hole. So this green region here is um, ruled out by gravitational waves because um, we don't want gravitational waves produced by black holes to dominate at the moment of PBN. And this dotted line here shows the border between the typical of the usual radiation domination, so standard cosmology, and a cosmology dominated by primordial black holes. Okay, now in this parameter scale here, I show you contour lines for different masses for dark matter. So dotted line correspond to one, uh, one NEV, one TEV, 10 to the 9 GV, and to the 15 GV. So that corresponds to the parameter state that matches the observed dark matter abundance. So for instance, you want a dark matter of one MeV, you would want to be here. And if it's 10 to the 15 GVs, you want to be here on this uh, uh, solid line. So just to show you that basically you can play model black holes, can radiate dark matter from the MeV-ish till, I mean, uh, and it's as heavy as uh, the Planck scale, uh, basically, right? So, this uh, region here that I'm showing you in what's that, like purple is the region that you want to avoid if dark matter is lighter than 30 GVs or so, because you want to, you want to avoid conflict with starter formation. So you want to avoid hot dark matter. Okay. So this is basically the, the common law for dark matter production out of primordial black hole. Again, you know how to radiate dark matter uh, heavier than few MeV, right? Up to the Planck scale. Well, so that's what we, uh, like the common law. However, things could be much more complicated because after all, what we are assuming here is that there's no portal or that the portal between dark matter and, and, uh, and, and the standard model is very suppressed and that it's only gravitationally. However, we are also assuming here, I was going to say, that there are no sizable self interaction. There are not interaction within the, the, the dark sector. So what, what happens if you take into account this self interaction, right? So when self interactions can arise, for instance, if you have scalar dark matter, you, you, you will have a, a quartic coupling I'm showing you here. So if dark matter poses sizable self interaction, Nicolas, we are losing you. The connection seems to be weak. Okay. 
<clears throat> so it seems we have a problem with this connection now. Probably we'll uh, connect again. So Daniel, maybe if he can't join, um, we can start the next one. Enrico is here, uh, but it's yeah, up to you. It's up to you. We can we, we can wait one one more minute. I guess he's trying to reconnect now. Uh, I don't have his uh, contact. Let's wait for one minute, and then otherwise we go with Enrico. Ah, here it is. Ah, sorry, sorry, man. Okay. Yeah, I have to make him a co-host again, just a sec. No, it's okay, I'm co-host. Ah, you okay, good. Perhaps you can uh, turn off your camera, Nicolas, just to improve the connection. You don't like my face? How? <laughs> uh, I'll stop video. Okay. okay. So, yes, I... I don't know if you heard what I was saying. Uh, I was saying that dark matter could thermalize via uh, elastic scattering. However, we can also have uh, number changing interactions like two to three, two to four. And therefore, dark matter or the dark sector could reach a chemical equilibrium as well. And for instance, again, here that I'm only having this quartic interaction here. So, here the question for having the dark matter abundance is. What's the total energy transfer from primordial black holes to dark matter? What is the dark matter temperature if they reach kinetic equilibrium? And what's the dark matter equilibrium number density if the dark sector managed to reach chemical equilibrium? And of course, when is chemical equilibrium broken? So for instance, you can have like a dark freeze out. So the effect of this interaction will be to increase the dark matter number density and in the price to pay, you have to decrease the mean dark matter kinetic energy. Because after all, the dark matter radiated by primordial black hole will be, I mean, will have a few particles, but ultra relativistic. So this number and this self interaction will trade kinetic energy into mass. So they will convert so ultra relativistic dark matter particles, few ultra relativistic dark matter particles into a number, a big number of. Uh, dark matter at rest, right? And that we're interested in these two effects, right? So for instance, here I'm showing you exactly the same, the same parameter space as before. So beta as a, as a function of the, dark, of the primordial black hole mass, where this dotted line corresponds to the case without such interaction, and this solid line here corresponds to the case with such interaction. So as I told you, the dark matter production becomes more efficient, and in that sense, smaller values of beta could be explored. Also, dark matter cools down, right? And therefore, lighter dark matter, in particular, KV dark matter, will become viable. Will not become, will not be constrained by by such a formation. And this was a more independent result in the sense that I'm just taking into account arguments of conservation of energy and conservation of entropy in the dark sector, but I'm not fixing a particular. Um, uh, model of, of, of dark matter, right? Okay, so, and that was, that corresponds here to 10 MeVs. However, it shall be the same plot for 10 KVs. Okay, 10 MeVs, 10 GVs, and 10 TVs. So the same result could, uh, I mean, I'm just showing different examples for different dark matter masses. Okay, so that was for, for, for self-interaction. However, there's another point I want to, to tell you guys about, about another gravitational UV uh, gravitational production of, uh, of dark matter and correspond to the gravitational UV freezing. So here again, exactly the same plot of before. And on the right, exactly the same information, just I'm switching a bit the parameter space where I'm projecting uh, the same information. So instead of beta and, and the initial mass, if you want, 
I'm showing you the, dark, the initial mass for, uh, for the black hole and the dark matter mass, right? So it's exactly the same information, the same color. So CMB in red, the underabundance in, in green, exactly the same thing. I just want to, to, because in this parameter space, it's clear that the bulk of the parameter space uh, corresponds to heavy dark matter. So 10 to the 6, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 14 GV and high temperatures of the, of the standard model plasma, 10 to the 15 GV, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 13. And if you think about gravitational production together with heavy dark matter and high heating temperatures, you could think also about the gravitational UV regime, which is basically an example of the UV regime mediated by the massless standard mobile graviton. Right? So for instance, in the early universe, dark matter could be produced out of this process. So uh, a scattering of standard model particles into dark matter particles, the, the, uh, and the S channel exchange of a standard model graviton. So you know what a standard model graviton is, it's just a spin to a massless spin to state that couples to matter the, uh, the um, uh, copy, which is one over the Planck mass, right? And this kind of diagram will depend on the dark matter mass and the dark matter spin and basta. If you compute the, compute the, the relic abundance, you will have also dependence on the reheating temperature. And that's it, but there are no free couplings because the only coupling that is the Planck mass, like right, is gravity. So there are no free, no, no, no free parameters. So here I'm showing you, for instance, a, a, a plot of the reheating temperature. So if you want to correspond to the highest, so, or, or better to the onset of the radiation domination in the early universe as a function of the dark matter mass. And if you, if you lay here exactly uh, on the edge of this triangle, you know, this corresponds to the parameter space, uh, you are able to reproduce hundred percent of the dark matter bond because freezing it's also very efficient of the gravity so in general it's very inefficient however it's efficient when you have heavy state heavy dark matter and very high reheating temperature so it's exactly the same parameter where you know how to produce uh, the the dark matter via uh, primordial black holes so here I show you the two plots that I uh, showed you before so but just uh, um, so the production of the Nicolas, are you there? Okay, this seems uh, difficult now. Sorry, man, I'm back. Yeah, okay. Can you see the slides again? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I don't know where, when the connection dropped, but I will just keep going. So I have like seven more minutes. Till now I have been talking about super heavy dark matter uh, radiated by primordial black holes. But now what happens if I take the opposite limit and I think about super light dark matter? So one example, correspond to the actions, and in particular to the QCD action. So we'll see what happens when you have super light dark matter, in particular QCD actions and primordial black holes. 
So first, a couple of, of, of words about um, about actions. I mean, Enrico will talk. Uh, we have this his talk about that on Wednesday, so I'll be very brief. So just to motivate the existence of, of actions, and particular choosing the action is that we have this piece of Lagrangian which corresponds to to QCD, to the conserving piece of QCD. So you have the kinetic term for gluons, for quarks, and the mass of quarks. However, there's a piece, another piece which is usually forgotten, which is the and the interesting thing is that with this term you can compute the electric dipole moment of the neutron, which has this form, but it has not been observed. That means that this value of this topping theta here has to be super suppressed, unnaturally small, and that's what we call the strong CP problem. So one possibility for solving this is to, um, to upgrade this constant to a dynamical field. And this dynamical field is in principle supposed to relax to its minimum of the potential. And therefore, that's what I mean. And that's, what, that, that's how we can, we can solve the, the, the strong QC problem. Like the dynamical relaxation of this, of this field theta, which is called the, the action. The interesting for us is that the energy density of this guy, as it's oscillating in a kind of quadratic potential, is that it will scale like, like dust, like non-relativistic matter. And therefore, it's a natural cold dark matter candidate. OK? So in the, in the useful paradigm of the misalignment mechanism for, for, producing, for producing action and action dark matter, what you have is that the initial misalignment angle so in the initial position, if you want, of the field when it starts to oscillate, there's a um, you you can compute what initial misalignment angle required in order to produce the whole observed dark matter abundance as a function of the action mass, right? And the action mass, the QCD action mass we can produce is on the old is super light, is of the order of micro electron volts or so. If you assume that this guy, this initial misalignment angle is of order one. Just like a natural number. So in a standard cosmology, the universe is, you have a, is um, radiation dominated. If you have a standard cosmology, the action, I mean, you know how to produce actions with a, with a initial misalignment, natural initial misalignment angle if the action is between, say, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5 electron volts. So I just want to emphasize that here we're talking about super light state, right? Okay, now what happens if you have primordial black holes and axions? So action, primordial black holes can naturally radiate actions. However, they will be ultra relativistic, right? They are very light, so they will be ultra relativistic at the moment of structure formation, so they cannot be cold dark matter. However, they will contribute to dark radiation in a typical amount of delta N effective of, say, 10 to minus 2 or so. And th th that's fine in the sense that it's not, it's okay with, with current observations. And here, for instance, I'm showing you contour plots of delta N effective, so 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. And what is nice here is that even if they are allowed, they will be within the reach of future CMB experiments. For instance, CMB stage four. So CMB stage four will, will test all this big chunk of the parameter space. So primordial black holes could not radiate action dark matter. However, the, the, the action that will radiate it will, will contribute to dark radiation with, within the future range of, of, of CMBS4 experiments. However, even, even if actions cannot radiate, cannot be radiated by primordial black holes, I mean, they can, in the sense that they cannot be the dark matter, primordial black holes can have a strong impact on the dark matter genesis via the misalignment mechanism. And, and that's due because primordial black holes could generate a non-standard cosmological phase in the early universe. And you have two modifications. First, they will enhance the Hubble expansion rate. And also, they will have an entropy injection that will dilute uh, the actions produced by the via misalignment mechanism. So here, for instance, I'm showing you for a given action mass, so 10 to the minus 7 or so, Electron volts. In red, I'm showing you the parameter space 
that uh, can give rise to the whole, to the whole dark, uh, action dark matter abundance. So let me emphasize, or let me recall you that this is very light. This corresponds to, to actions somewhere, somewhere here. So it's a very light action. That will not, you will say that it's not naturally produced via the misalignment angle, via the misalignment mechanism. However, if you take into account primordial black holes, you know how to produce the whole uh, action dark matter abundance for 10 to the minus seven and 10 to the minus eight, right? Due to this non-standard cosmological phase of the early universe. So here I'm showing you exactly the same plot as before. So lambda, the, sorry, theta initial, the initial is alignment angle as a function of the, of the, of the action mass. The thick black line corresponds to radiation domination. And therefore you see that for order one is alignment angle, you know how to produce action between 10 to the minus six and 10 to the minus five. That corresponds to the standard window, so radiation domination. However, when you have primordial black hole, you can have a non-standard cosmology and therefore you can increase this standard uh, window. So you know how to produce actions much lighter. So between 10 to the minus eight, and 10 to the minus five electron volts, just because of this non-standard phase of the early universe. And I think I'm kind of running out of time. So I just have an extra slide, slide sorry. So it corresponds to the case, not to ARPs, not to actions, to the QCD action, but to ARPs in general. So action like light particles. And this is really my, my very last slide, uh, Daniel. So here I'm showing you uh, similar the parameter space. So here is the mass of the action or of the action like particles. And here instead I'm showing you the coupling between actions and or arcs and two and two photons. Because after all, actions will decay to a couple of photons. So this line here, this um, what color is this? Like green band correspond to, to QCD action. QCD actions in radiation domination, so uh, between 10 to the minus six and 10 to the minus five. And you can see here in lighter green that this window can be enhanced due to the effect of primordial black holes. That's exactly what I showed you before. However, here I'm showing you also in like this pinkish, what happens to ARPs. So in radiation domination, ARPs could be, uh, are, there, are here in this thick uh, uh, pinkish band, right? So the action that you can produce via the misalignment mechanism. However, you can see that once you take into account primordial black holes, the non-standard cosmological um, history produced by primordial black holes make this band to increase and to, to be able to explore much smaller values for this coupling between actions and, and gamma. And that's interesting because these new regions of the parameter space could be probed by future experiments, which uh, correspond here to the light, light blue. So these regions here correspond to um, prospects of experiments like abracadabra, dark matter radio, or clash. And I think I'm super late, so I'm just uh, finish here. So we'll have different points here. So it's possible that dark matter only features gravitational interactions. And I put this, this frame here. So primordial black holes are forming the uni early universe due to large inhomogeneities in the, in the matter contra contrast. So if we have a very light uh, black holes in the ballpark of say grams to 100 stones or so, they will be they will fully evaporate before BDM and therefore they are very poorly constrained. Primordial black holes will hockey radiate, cool holes can radiate the whole dark matter abundance. For dark matter masses between, say, LED scale to Planck scale or so. This corresponds basically to the, to the common law of primordial black holes and dark matter. However, things could be much more complicated. For instance, you have dark matter self interactions, and self interaction could boost the, the dark matter density, cooling down also dark matter, which is also very nice. Another point is that if you take into account this um, gravitational production, you have to take into account all gravitational production, and in particular, the UV freezing that is always there. There is no, no couplings to, to play with. And what happens if you have very light dark, dark matter particles? For instance, you have axions or action light particles. 
The point is that primordial black holes do not radiate axions or, or out as dark matter because they would be very relativistic. So they will not contribute to dark matter, but to dark radiation within the reach of future experiments like CMBS4. However, the non-standard cosmological epoch due to the presence of primordial black holes will have a strong impact on the misalignment mechanism. For instance, you will wider the, the action mass, giving rise to the possibility of having lighter action. And this new parameter space will be within the future reach of experiments like Abracadabra, Clash, ADMX, and dark matter radio. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for all these problems with the connection. Thank you, Nicolas. So it's time for questions. Enrico. Enrico? Yes, hi, Nicolas. Um, can you go back to your slide 14, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, here. So there is one thing that uh, I'm not uh, understanding. So when you say hot dark matter with mass smaller than 30 GeV, the 30 GeV looks a bit uh, larger to me. Shouldn't it be much lighter to be hot, really hot? Yeah, yes. Well, I think you, what you have in mind is like this, I think it's well, few KVs, right? Which yeah. is a typical bound for, for wind, for instance, or for fins. Yeah. Here the problem, well, the difference is that um, dark matter here is produced uh, uh, with a much light, heavy, much bigger kinetic energy. Oh, I see. Ah, okay. And so even larger much, masses can, can be hot then. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So th that's why. And also they are produced much, um, much late. Okay. The, the bulk of the dark matter of dark matter here is produced very close to BBN, so that's also why. I see. I see. It's Thanks. Not produced at X equal twenty or so, ten per kilogram, uh -huh. not twenty as usual. Yeah. It is more closer to BBN, so that's why. Yes, this constraint from hot dark matter is up, uh, around uh, say thirty GVs and not few KVs. I see. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, hi, Nicolas. I also have some problems with my connection this morning. Uh, so I don't know if I missed the, the first few slides, sorry. Um, so how this or, or yours would be uh, working with like uh, um, scale structure formation and especially issues with the small scale? Um, I don't know if you mentioned that maybe. But I... Are you thinking about also the constraint? I mean, when I say here hot dark matter, I mean, the constraint that I'm putting is I want dark matter to be non relativistic at the moment of the quality. Oh, okay. So, in principle, I will not have trouble with the with structure formation. But that was what you had in mind? Well, I was thinking that sometimes, as far as I understand, there can be issues um, if the small scale clamping which starts at six of 10 to the seven uh, is not there which is like this c high k the z or z high k of 10 to the seven um where um i'm a beginner so i will talk about that <laughs> later today but uh but i i'm learning from my son <laughs> <laughs> who's working on this <laughs> so um but but i understand that there is this issue that of course, you know the main uh, fluctuations uh, on on the structure formation are caused at at um, much smaller ranges of set to the thirty or twenty or so. But there are some important clumping that starts at much smaller scales, like Z ten to the seven. And I was wondering if you had thought about that. No, no. Okay, okay. I Maybe we can discuss. Conservative, just taking. Uh... Okay. Okay. All the, the quality. Okay, maybe we can discuss offline. I would yeah, like yeah, to. True, true. That would be yeah. great. Thank you. Thank no, you, Nicolas. Thank, thank you
I don't see any other questions, so uh, we can thank uh, Nicolas again. And, uh, thank you, guys. I'm the... sorry for this problem with the connection. And uh, we move to the last uh, talk of this session by Enrico Bertuso. Enrico, you are co-host here. Yeah. So Enrico will talk about uh, relaxation physics 